Shopping. Later, all new Fisk. Hayley Dodd's mother makes an emotional appeal to her daughter's killer. You've known you've done it. Just tell us where she is and we can rest. WA calls for more certainty in vaccine supply to allow better planning. Police and tourism operators gearing up for what could be the busiest Easter on record. And explore Perth's forgotten past. Watch the city changing with the click of a button. Good evening, Pamela Medlin with ABC News. The family of missing teenager Hayley Dodd has pleaded with the man convicted of killing her 20 years ago to tell them where her body is so they can lay her to rest. Francis Walk was today acquitted of murdering the 17-year-old but found guilty of the lesser offence of manslaughter. He now faces up to 20 years in jail. Margaret Dodd has fought for two decades for justice for her teenage daughter. Now all she wants is the man convicted of killing the 17-year-old to tell her family where she is. We'd be able to just lay her to rest and we could actually try and get on with our lives. You know, our lives have just been in limbo for 22 years. He has affected every single one of our family members, down from mum and dad to us children, to the grandchildren, to the great they will continue to be destroyed because he can't tell us where she is and therefore we can't feel safe. Hayley Dodd was last seen alive in July 1999, walking along a road near Badgingarra in WA's Wheatbelt region. The disappearance remained a mystery until 2013, when a cold case review found an earring, believed to be hers, caught up in a car seat cover, seized in 1999 from a vehicle driven by Francis Walk. At the time, Walk was serving a 13-year jail term in Queensland for the violent sexual assault of a woman he had picked up on a remote road. He was interviewed about Hayley Dodd before being charged with her murder and extradited to Perth. In his seven-week trial before a jury, prosecutors alleged he had murdered the 17-year-old in the course of a sexual attack. He denied killing the teenager and after 11 and a half hours of deliberations over three days, the jury acquitted him of murder but convicted him of manslaughter. While the reasons for the jury's verdict will never be known, it appears it wasn't satisfied that Francis Walk had intended to kill Hayley Dodd. Walk will be sentenced in a fortnight and he faces a jail term of up to 20 years. Ideally we would have wanted murder, but we've got manslaughter, so you know, at least it's not going to get out. A manslaughter charge, that's stuff all the time. He won't die in prison. Walk can appeal against his conviction. Joanna Minar, ABC News. Australia's vaccination program is rolling along slowly as federal and state governments argue over who is to blame. Fewer than 700,000 doses have been administered, nowhere near the original goal of 4 million doses by today. Western Australia has administered more than 50,000 doses, which is the highest rate of any state. Here's Rhiannon Shine with the breakdown. More than 32,000 WA healthcare workers have received at least their first COVID-19 vaccine so far, including 4,000 frontline healthcare workers. At Perth's three major hospitals, 75% of frontline staff have had the vaccine. Almost all of the 500 police officers working either at hotel quarantine or the airport have been vaccinated. Three officers have chosen not to get it and are being redeployed elsewhere. And just over 2,000 border workers have had at least one dose of the vaccine. But the uptake has been slower among WA's hotel quarantine workers. Just half of that workforce has had the jab so far. The WA Health Minister Roger Cook says the state government would like more certainty from the Commonwealth on supply to help it plan further ahead for the rollout here. Queensland has recorded just two new locally acquired cases of COVID in the past 24 hours. They are a nurse and her housemate. Crucially, they're linked to existing infections stemming from the Princess Alexandra Hospital. This nurse is the third medical staffer to acquire the virus at the hospital, raising serious concerns about contamination. More than 1,000 people are now in quarantine because of two clusters. But authorities are heartened by the huge numbers of people getting tested. 
In homes around Greater Brisbane, people are packing and hoping COVID won't ruin their Easter holiday plans. I'm kind of half packed, but then not completely. I figured I'd just do what I can. The Mars are planning a Fraser Island getaway. We all like going to the beach surfing. Today, uh, we have some very encouraging news. Just two new community infections were picked up overnight. One is a nurse who works at the PA hospital, the other her housemate. She has the same strain as a patient who returned from India. He was admitted to the infectious diseases ward at 8.30pm on the 23rd of March. The nurse, who had been vaccinated, began her shift at 10pm but never had direct contact with him which means that there is most likely some environmental contamination or some um, aerosolisation of the virus when the person was admitted. The ward has been closed and cleaned. In total, there are now 11 people in that cluster, including another PA hospital nurse and the Hens Party, which travelled to Byron Bay in northern New South Wales. Authorities there are now imposing restrictions after a man in his 20s tested positive having visited the Byron Beach Hotel at the same time as the women from Queensland. There's probably more to come over the next few days. I think it would be pretty naive to think otherwise. A separate cluster involving a PA hospital doctor stands at eight after testing revealed two suspect cases were in fact negative. While Brisbane streets remain relatively quiet... Queues continue at testing clinics. More than 33,000 people were swabbed yesterday. That is a massive, massive number. So I thank every single one of the people who came forward yesterday and got themselves tested. That has been critical. The health minister among them. She has a sore throat, so she's gone to get a COVID test. So uh, the health minister is following exactly her own advice. Most are following the Queensland-wide mask mandate too. 9am tomorrow is when we find out if the lockdown can be lifted. It all depends on the number of new infections and if they can be linked to the existing clusters. Tourism operators and families are holding their breath and crossing their fingers. If we see very good testing rates across Queensland and we don't see any unlinked community transmission, the signs for Easter are looking positive. Jessica Van Vonderen, ABC News. And Easter in WA could be the busiest ever. Police are expecting unprecedented traffic on roads as families head to holiday spots in regional areas. Extra officers will be targeting speeding, mobile phone use and dangerous driving. There will also be increased alcohol and drug testing. With interstate options less popular, more people are travelling within the state, especially compared to Easter last year when WA was in the middle of a pandemic lockdown. Police are urging drivers to take extra care. I think we had one um, fatality and four serious crashes last Easter. Um, and previous years there's been you know, up to two or three fatalities. Um, so we, we don't want any fatalities. Every, every one of those is, is, is a tragedy. Double demerits will kick in from midnight tonight until the end of Monday night. To finance now, and the Australian share market is recovering, but still not at pre-pandemic levels. Here's Daniel Ziffer. We do this every day, but what's important is the way the economy moves over time. As we end this quarter of the year, the value of the ASX 200, a basket of the 200 biggest companies on the stock exchange, is up 3%. But it's still down 5% from its record high of February last year. Across the economy, there's a lot of recovery to go to get back to even where we were. Locally, shares in energy company Santos fell after it announced it would spend almost $5 billion opening up a gas field 300 kilometres north of Darwin. So, in the water. It's for the export market, and it's the same plan paused a year ago. Meanwhile, New Zealand's key index remains near record highs. Shares in its 50 most valuable companies have doubled in six years. Maybe it's the fresh air. And the price of oil keeps bouncing around after all that excitement with the big stuck ship. Currencies were generally stable. Speaking of currency, you'd assume with the growth of contactless payments that cash was on the way out. Instead, 
the amount of currency out there has soared at the fastest rate in 45 years, meaning there are a lot of lumpy mattresses out there. And that's finance. There's now an interactive map which allows people to just about turn back time and relive Perth's forgotten past. It contains thousands of images of how the city has grown and the changes can be explored block by block. 150 years of history in high definition. The Old Perth Project, spearheaded by the State Library and Curtin University, puts the past at your fingertips. From the pensioners' barracks at the top of St George's Terrace, to the Perth Town Hall, still around 151 years later. The city's growth is captured in this 1920s shot of the Kings Park War Memorial. And in Hyde Park, trees planted more than a century ago still stand. This site is a very easy rabbit hole to fall down into. There's just so much um, interesting things to explore and there are so many places I remember and I'm sure you know other people will remember as well and that is a great trip down memory lane. Many of the city's original buildings were knocked down in the mid to late 20th century skyscraper building boom. Just like the buildings, public opinion has moved on. Do you reckon they should have kept them there? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Always, always keep the heritage ones, absolutely. I think that it's difficult to turn back the clock, so I think the more that we can save the better. I'm right. I'm a big supporter of heritage buildings. Oh, yeah, I mean, it has a bit of character to it, doesn't it? Yeah. It sort of makes yeah. it feel like, a, you know, a bit of an older city, you know? Yeah. This database is just a small example of what's out there. The State Library has almost a million historical images in its archives, and the old Perth team hope to get out of the CBD and add more photos from across the state. John DiPoloni, ABC News. Still to come this hour, should retirees be forced to spend their nest egg? Reverse mortgage to a degree has been my saviour. People are concerned they might outlive their savings and ending up leaving large balances as inheritances. So it's all right to blow your money, but don't give any to your kids. Also, popular entertainer Kamal on the jokes that made him the punchline. That's coming up. The Australian Government has joined 13 other countries in expressing concerns about a long-awaited report into the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. Questions remain because there are fears investigators did not get access to complete data. From London, Europe correspondent Nick Dole reports. Like much of the world, the UK has got used to grim statistics. But behind each of these 150,000 love hearts was a life with a family left behind. Fran Hall's husband Steve died last October, just three weeks after their wedding. And he became ill the day after we got married and was taken to hospital a week later and sadly they just couldn't, they couldn't save him. But I was really lucky, I was able to be with him when he died. Victims' families want answers about how the virus started and what was done to stop it. Earlier this year, the World Health Organisation sent a team to Wuhan to investigate the possible origins of the pandemic. The joint WHO-China study has now been published and concludes the virus was probably transmitted from bats to humans via another animal. A lab leak was found to be extremely unlikely, but nothing has been ruled out completely. We've left it on the table and if more evidence comes forward, fine, it needs to be followed up. In a joint statement, Australia and more than a dozen other countries voiced their shared concerns that the study was significantly delayed and lacked access to complete original data and samples. They want a second phase investigation by experts that's free from interference. Yes, there are more things perhaps that we might have been uh, given, uh, but in general terms, they gave us a lot of data that the world hasn't seen before. It's hard to grasp just how many lives have been destroyed by this pandemic. Of course, the death toll is just part of the story. While the international community is still struggling to contain this outbreak, there are doubts about its ability to contain the next. The UK is among the nations backing an international pandemic treaty to improve warning systems and share vaccines. And we should be working together. We should be working across the globe together, but that's an ideal world. It's never going to happen. Thousands, if not millions of lives, could depend on it. Nick Dole, ABC News, London. 
Military planning is well underway for a new defence unit dedicated to protecting Australia's assets in space. But the Chief of Air Force has conceded the country is several years behind other nations in the jostle for supremacy in the final frontier, as Andrew Green explains. Australia's newest deadly weapon already has a long and controversial history. Despite recent concerns emerging from the US military, the Joint Strike Fighter still enjoys strong support from the top brass here. My advice as a professional aviator to the government is that the F-35 is the right capability for Australia. While the RAF celebrates its first 100 years... Great General Salute presents... Chiefs firmly focusing on the next century of challenges, particularly the final frontier of space. And we're probably about three or four years behind where I would rather be um, at the moment, but we're catching up quickly. The global contest for space supremacy is intensifying, and in Australia's self-described space capital, there's no disguising it's a case of beam me up, Scotty. The RAF's motto is through struggle to the stars. And so it's quite fitting that we're here talking about our own ambitions for the stars. Scott Morrison's officially opened the Australian Space Discovery Centre and revealed ambitions for locally made ballistic missiles. That's a capability that meshes together with our alliance partners as well. We need to make sure that we maximise Australian content and we maximise Australian jobs. Defence chiefs hope to finalise a review of their space capabilities by Christmas as they look to form a new dedicated command inside the ADF. Unlike the recently created US Space Force, it won't be a separate military service, but a joint operation staffed by Air Force, Army and Navy personnel. Andrew Green, ABC News, Canberra. Federal Labor is promising to make electric cars cheaper and bring down power bills. The promises came as Labor wrapped up its two-day national conference that will help guide its approach to the next election. Here's political reporter Matthew Doran. You're hopping in the driver's seat. A relatively new leader keen to steer his party away from the failures of the past. We didn't win the election. Anthony Albanese wants more Australians driving electric cars promising to cut taxes on the zero emissions vehicles to get more of them on the nation's roads. In a decade's time, you'll struggle to walk into a car yard like this and find something that's not an EV. It's a cautious approach compared to his predecessor's pledge to ensure half of all new vehicles by 2030 were electric, which was met by fierce coalition campaigning. We are going to stand by our tradies and we are going to save their utes. I didn't ridicule that technology. What I called into question was the Labor Party policy and their ability to implement it. Along with a pledge to install 400 so-called community batteries across the country to store excess solar power and reduce power bills for 100,000 households, Labor's policy conference has reaffirmed support for gas-fired energy and coal miners. Another nod to the loss at the last election, arguing it's needed to shore up blue-collar votes. Those workers didn't trust Labor with their future. Labor took a bumper book of policies to the last election, some of which proved to be a turn-off to its traditional base. By the time Australians next go to the polls, party sources say Labor will have fewer policies and be more attuned to aspirational voters in outer suburban and regional areas as it tries to navigate a path to government. So that good driving, that's why they made me Transport Minister. And he wants a promotion next time around. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Sydney. Young people with disabilities can often find it tough to get work in areas that interest them and pay reasonably. But over the past decade, hundreds have been helped by a unique not-for-profit organisation. The style and the colours, and I love it, and it's so beautiful. Working in the fashion industry is Stephanie Trintran's dream. The 21-year-old from Western Sydney who lives with autism struggled to get training and work until she came to not-for-profit organisation Avenue. The best thing working here are teamwork, learning new skills. I did some stock take where I had to sort all the sizes to see how many we had in stock. 
Stephanie is one of more than 300 people with disability working for Avenue. Participants are funded through the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Avenue was established 12 years ago when the O'Reilly family saw their late son and brother Shane, who lived with cerebral palsy, struggle to get work. He saw himself as leaving school, and like his older siblings, going out and working. Um, but for our family it was a real shock to discover when Shane got to the end of Year 12 that society didn't see him in the same way. Avenue now has more than 25 partners. One of them is fashion label Yevu. Founded by an Australian, Yevu is made in Ghana by women who also struggle to get work. Sold online, it's distributed worldwide by Avenue. We really believe that everyone has a human right to have access to dignified work because what that does is it can really transform that person in terms of their sense of self-confidence, their sense of value, their sense of purpose. This program is unique because it sees people with disability choosing the work they do and earning real money. What Avenue is is really trying to redefine work in a way that includes everybody. I like the sleeves providing much-needed jobs for people keen to work. Naz Campanella, ABC News. In sport, West Coast coach Adam Simpson says the club is investigating ways of managing captain Luke Shuey as he returns from another soft tissue injury. Shuey missed the first two rounds with a hamstring strain, the same injury which sidelined him twice last year. There is no doubt Luke Shuey makes the Eagles a better side. But the captain has struggled with soft tissue injuries recently. Last year, he injured both legs against Essendon, while in July he missed two games with a hamstring injury. Now he's returning from an injury suffered during the pre-season. We're looking into it. I don't think we've quite cracked the code on, on what to do to get him through a full season. Um, but it'll be a bit of management, maybe positional change, maybe the way he trains. Shuey will play restricted minutes against Port Adelaide on Saturday night at Perth Stadium. The power go into the game as slim favourites after consecutive 50-point wins to start the season. Oh, it's some sort of show they're putting on! If they're not number one, they're pretty close. So their brand stands up. It's been really strong for, for a long time now and they've got good kids coming through. So massive challenge again this week. Doesn't, doesn't stop. Fremantle's AFLW finals campaign has begun in style with midfielder Kiara Bowers claiming the Coaches Association Award. It might not be the end of Bowers' awards, She's among the favourites for the competition's best and fairest. Tom Wildey, ABC News. Perth Wildcats coach Trevor Gleeson says his side is prepared for a stint of road games after the Queensland coronavirus outbreak forced fixtures to be reshuffled. The Wildcats will play the Sydney Kings on Thursday in Perth before heading east for three games, including a match in Tasmania. Gleeson says his side had expected disruptions. So we said at the start of the year, we've just got to be adaptable and get ready to roll with the punches, and our guys have been really good with that so far. The Cats have won seven straight games and sit at the top of the NBL ladder. Incoming Netball WA Chief Executive Simone Hansen says she's looking forward to leading the West Coast Fever out of the salary cap scandal. The Fever faces a difficult year ahead. Coach Stacey Marinkovic will be leaving at the end of the season to focus on her national duties and the entire playing list will be out of contract. When I looked at the role, again I looked at the, my skill alignment and what I, it looked like netball across the state needed. And while I understand that there may be some challenges, that, that's exciting and fun. So I look forward to being able to lead the team past what's occurred. Hanson has extensive experience in business and finance. The Australian Olympic Committee is confident its athletes will be vaccinated before the Tokyo Olympics. The committee unveiled the Australian uniforms in Sydney today. They're less than four months to go until the Games. Coronavirus cases are on the rise in Japan, but the AOC says the athletes will be living in a bubble and should all be vaccinated before travelling there. The athletes have been told they won't be jumping the queue in the vaccine rollout. There's always a level of concern. I think holding a massive event like this could poise issues, but I think there's been examples of events being held all around the world now where, that have been done safely, um, and I have that most faith in the AOC and, and Japan. The AOC plans to send around 480 athletes to the Games. 
It was all eyes to the sky in Canberra this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force celebrated its centenary. Onlookers were treated to a spectacular flyover featuring military aircraft past and present. Flying the flag for 100 years. It allows us to commemorate those that have served in blue. It also allows us to take time out to remember the 11,191 Australians who served in the Royal Australian Air Force and did not make it home. It's a great day. It's, um, it's uh, very, very emotional for me. Thousands of people gathered around Lake Burley Griffin, some even taking to the water. They were treated to a once-in-a-century air show in perfect flying conditions. It was amazing and I think it's one of those things where the big kids and the little kids thoroughly enjoyed it. More than 60 aircraft, past and present, took part, including the Hudson, Second World War planes like the Spitfire and Silver Mustang, as well as stealth fighters culminating in a jaw-dropping performance by the Roulette's aerobatic team. This is a very spectacular display. It comes only with people with experience and expertise. And as far as I'm concerned, this is air power in high level. The event was an opportunity for the Air Force to show the country what it's all about. <laughs> On this day 100 years ago, the Australian Air Corps became the Australian Air Force, with King George V approving the use of the word royal in June 1921. But a lot has changed since then. There's cultural changes that are happening everywhere, especially with getting a lot more women into STEM positions that we're having. We get to have a lot more uh, flexibility between roles and ranks as well. Here's to another 100 years. Isaac Naruzi, ABC News, Canberra. Now with weather, here's Tyne Logan. Hello. There was still a bit of humidity around this morning, but it did feel cooler today in the city, with an early maximum just shy of 27 degrees at 20 to 12, and the low 19.7 at 10 to 7 this morning. It's still a bit muggy outside now, and 23 degrees. Now, Balladonia on the far southeast coast had the lowest minimum in the state today at 11 degrees, with temperatures mild to warm most other places around the south and hot in the central west and goldfields. But the hottest place in the state was once again Mardi at 41 degrees and temperatures close to it all over the north with no rain and easterly winds. There was also some very large tides today as well, over 10.5 metres in Broome and Derby at midday. There was almost no sand left to walk on at all at the beach. Looking to the satellite, the main area of cloud was around the southwest corner of the state where there was a cold front and a lot of mid-level cloud which brought light rain all over the district from Perth to Bremer Bay. And you're going to see more of that rain around the southwest coast tomorrow from about Bustleton down. The temperatures will get hot again in Perth tomorrow though and in the central west as a trough extends down the west coast and brings in the offshore winds. Looking around the country tomorrow, showers are continuing on the east Queensland and northern New South Wales coast, but generally mild to warm temperatures for the eastern state's capitals. Adelaide will be a bit warmer at 31 and Darwin 33. Back in WA, there's possible storms in Colombaroo, but elsewhere dry and generally easterly winds. Temperatures will be in the mid to high 30s. It's staying hot in the central west with several places cracking the 40 degree mark, the high 30s for the goldfields, and with those hot conditions, there is severe fire danger in the north coast and inland parts of the central west and inland Gascoigne with several total fire bans in those areas. There's also a strong wind warning for the North, North Kimberley coast as well as the Gascoyne and Geraldton coasts. And there could be a bit of rain around the southwest corner of the state between 1 and 8 millimetres forecast, most of it in the south, mild elsewhere. Getting hot again in Perth tomorrow, up to 35 degrees with clouds clearing and moderate winds easterly in the morning, which is why you'll see that temperature increase. The winds could be variable throughout the day though. There's a southwesterly swell, one to two metres, and the winds on the water will be southeasterly, 10 to 15 knots, up to 20 knots early in the morning, then shifting to southwesterly in the afternoon.
Sunrise is at 6.28 and sunset at 13 past 6. And looking ahead, the weekend forecast has been given a bit of a boost. It's going to be 32 on Good Friday, then 34 on Saturday and 35 on Sunday. But it's going to ease back to the milder weather by Monday, Pamela. Thanks, Tyne. And that's ABC News for now. I'll be back with you tomorrow. In the meantime, you can stay up to date with ABC News Online. Stay with us now for 7.30 with Lee Sales. Welcome to the program.